Hi and welcome to Showcase, broadcasting across the world from our studios here in Istanbul. Coming up on the show, we'll step into the fantastical world of a Spanish topiary artist and speak to a movie critic about why some people are calling Mission Impossible Fallout the movie of summer 2018. But first... Very, very surprising that HBO didn't stay on top and uh, these streaming services are definitely major contenders in the awards races now. A new era for the Emmy Awards. Streaming service Netflix leads the way with the most nominations. Transformation Istanbul, as the Kadıköy Mural Festival revs into action. Since the beginning of time, humankind has used everything from rock cliffs and caves to express thoughts or record history. Whether they're simple line drawings or detailed murals, these primitive forms of public art have evolved over millennia. The only difference is that today, they grace even more elaborate surfaces. Showcases Shiraz Ali ventured to a place not far from our studios where that very idea is playing out. Located on the Asian side of Istanbul, Kadokoy continues to thrive as an artistic cornerstone. With its shops and restaurants overlooking the Sea of Marmara, it has become a hip place for locals and expats alike. Started in 2012, the Kadokoy Mural Festival is now in its seventh year. This time around, it welcomes four artists, with three foreign and one local to create murals for each of their open-air canvases. For all to see, admire or criticize. But first, some background. A mural is a painting on a wall or ceiling, either inside or outside of a structure. They also can incorporate the building or elements around it into the artwork, creating a synergy. Some of the first murals date back to 30,000 BC and in ancient Egyptian tombs dating back to 3,150 BC. They usually tell stories of sorts, either from events in history to a simple daily activity of their society. The 1920s was when the Mexican muralism art movement started, where the government hired painters to make murals to tell the story of their history and ideas. Nowadays, take Banksy for example, some see his work as graffiti than a mural. So there's a blurred line between the two depending on what is painted and where. The term graffiti is loosely used for Banksy as he does not get permission for his work. But what he has achieved is the modern day mural and his work has a social message with a dash of humour at times. With murals already completed by artists from Brazil and Serbia, let's look at the remaining two. Hailing from Croatia, Lonak, meaning cooking pot, is well known for his surreal photorealistic murals around the world. Choose the ones that have great artists before, because I want to see uh, murals in life from the previous years, and uh, just to leave my mark someplace I haven't been before. Named intermission in reference to the short break between films, Lonak has on average seven days to complete his work. The building itself is sometimes is very good. If, if there's a problem with the building, then you have to, uh, I don't know, figure out how to do something that matches the, I don't know, some element on the wall. Born and raised in Dalian on the southwest coast of Turkey, Umira was first introduced to street art by graffiti. This festival is very different because we've seen many names we wouldn't be able to see at other festivals. The artists that came are famous worldwide. Also, murals are not like graffiti. It is a different category. Most festivals in Turkey are about graffiti art and text. It is a category people usually don't understand. In some cases, if the walls we want to paint are private property, then we have to get permission from the owner. We don't want to get a bad public reputation. 
But sometimes, when we realize we won't be able to get a permit for a wall we like, we work on them illegally. Graffiti used to be considered the work of vandals, but now has become an accepted and sometimes commissioned aspect of many urban landscapes. They often tell the stories of neighborhoods and communities, while at the same time adding color and vibrancy to spaces in true DIY style, which brings me back to the Catco Mural Festival. Co-founder and director of Mural Istanbul Festival, Mehdi has been living in the neighborhood for the past 15 years and states that since their first festival in 2012, there has been more footfall into the areas. The municipality only funds the festival. We've been organizing this festival on behalf of the municipality for seven years. We mostly volunteer and we are volunteering this year as well. There are times we even spend our own money as graffiti artists. The funding is not as high as people assume it to be. As for the financial benefits to the neighborhood, that does not concern us. I support the Miro Festival. What they are doing is really, truly beautiful. There were very good artworks in previous years as well. There was one more empty wall in our street that was not included in the festival program. But we got permission to get that painted as well. The murals are appealing and look way better than some writings on the walls. They make us happy. So far, 36 artists have created their artwork on over 32 walls creating a unique open-air exhibition for all locals and visitors to admire for years to come. The Mural Festival wants to grow and expand beyond the bounds of Kadokoi, not only to have more expressive space, but to add artistic touches one wall at a time. With more cities around the world projecting 3D images onto buildings, would this be the next step in murals? After all, we have advanced a long way since the first murals. Shiraz Ali, TRT World, Istanbul. It's one of the biggest events for the performers and behind-the-scene players of the small screen. The nominees are in for the 70th Primetime Emmy Awards. Next are some of the highlights from this year's list, including the series that roared its way back into the race and the network that knocked HBO off its throne. Thank you so much. It's the most exciting time of the year for U.S. primetime television, as the nominees of the Emmy Awards are in. After sitting out last year's race, HBO's fantasy smash Game of Thrones is back for the gold with 22 nods, including Best Drama Series. Close behind are Saturday Night Live and Westworld, the two shows that dominated last year's event earned 21 nominations each. We built this world together. I'm trying to keep you alive. The Handmaid's Tale is also worth a mention. Now I have to leave her. Handmaid's Tale, I believe, was nominated for 13 Emmys last year. They picked up, I believe, it was 20 nominations total this year. So, I mean, they're definitely, you know, here to stay. Um, you know, people just absolutely love that show. The critical acclaim it's received for, you know, its second season has been fantastic. I mean, everyone is praising, you know, the look of the show, the storytelling, the writing, I mean, the acting. This restlessness of yours, it has to be a thing of the past. Another big winner was Netflix, which received more than 100 nods for its shows, including The Crown, and Stranger Things. Sort of shadow. The streaming service also broke HBO's 17-year streak as the most nominated network. Very, very surprising that HBO didn't stay on top and uh, these streaming services are definitely major contenders in the awards races now. People say I am a genius. Emmy diversity also got a boost this year. More than a third of the acting nominations went to ethnic minorities, including the assassination of Gianni Versace co-stars Penelope Cruz and Ricky Martin. Everything you see around us, this house, this company, was his life. This is the most diverse class of performer nominees we've ever had. I think we're almost up to a third, which is fantastic. You know, we also have almost a third brand new performers this year, which is also great. Um, still a lot of work to be done. Uh, I definitely think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of gender parity uh, in a lot of the behind the scenes work uh, and even some of the top of the line with your directing 
and writing. Now that the nominees are revealed, the countdown can begin for the ceremony in September, which will be held at the Microsoft Theatre in Los Angeles. Before those ceremonies begin, you can bet TV critics around the globe are making predictions as to who will win an Emmy Award and who will go home empty-handed. One of them joins me now from Morganville, New Jersey, to share his predictions. Tony Maglio is the TV editor for TheWrap.com. Thanks so much for being with us today, Tony. Now, Game of Thrones is leading with 22 nominations. That doesn't come to many as a surprise, does it? No, I think that um, was kind of a safe prediction to make. They missed the qualifying period last year because of production um, when Westworld and Saturday Night Live both had 22 nominations of their own. So Game of Thrones getting 22 this year and leading the pack was pretty predictable. Um, in 2016, Game of Thrones, the last year that it was uh, eligible for Emmys, had 23 nominations and led the way there. So 22 seems right in the ballpark and Game of Thrones being number one uh, makes sense to everybody. Well, Game of Thrones, as you said, uh, wasn't able to compete last time, and The Handmaid's Tale actually took home the prize. Do you think that they're going to compete this time around? I think so. Um, I think it'll be one or the other. Uh, I could see Handmaid's winning again and kind of setting the trend for going forward as Game of Thrones ends. But, you know, look, if Game of Thrones wins the night's final award, top drama, no one in Hollywood will be surprised, no TV critics will be surprised. There is one dark horse here, though. The Americans though a long shot, could come in and win and, and upset both of them because it's the Americans' final season. And that show has been a critical darling for a very long time. And Emmy voters may reward it, knowing that it's their last opportunity to do so. For the first time in 17 years, uh, Netflix broke HBO's uh, record for having the most nominations. Um, is this another major sign that streaming services are uh, surpassing mainstream television? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, the money is just so huge for these streaming services. And practically speaking, their hours are endless. There is no schedule. So it's really hard for anyone to keep up, even HBO, which is incredible, historically incredible, still puts out incredible TV. Netflix and, and Hulu and, and Amazon and other streaming services they could just make endless hours of programming. And at some point, you know, the best ones are going to rise to the top. If you have the most shows, chances are you have the most best shows. All right. Now, the Emmy Awards will be handed out in September. And of course, we'll be bringing you that as it happens. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. Thank you for having me. Still to come on Showcase, for Tom Cruise, the sixth time is the charm. You had a terrible choice to make in Berlin. One life over millions. And now the world is at risk. Ethan Hunt and the IMF are back and tasked with another impossible mission. The real-life Edward Scissorhands, a Spanish topiary artist, creates a living sculpture garden. We'll have those stories for you later in the show, but first, here's a quick look at a few others that caught our attention. The remains of a 2,500-year-old mummification workshop have been unearthed in a complex of tombs near Egypt's Great Pyramids. Archaeologists hope the workshop will provide insight into how ancient Egyptians used to mummify their dead. Inside a burial chamber located above the workshop, a silver mask gilded with pure gold was also found, the second such discovery ever made. The movie of the award-winning television period drama Downton Abbey is set for production with the original cast from the series returning. The story will pick up in 1926, where the historical drama ended after six seasons. The show's creator, Julian Fellows, will hand the script, while Brian Percival will take the director's chair. Production begins this summer. And in Thailand, more than 300 artists have come together to create a giant painting in commemoration of the rescue operation. Last week, a team of international divers rescued 12 young football players and their coach from a flooded cave. A portrait of Saman 
Hunan, a Navy SEAL who died during the rescue mission, will be part of the mural. The painting will eventually be displayed as part of a planned cave museum. For movers and shakers in Hollywood, the long-running Mission Impossible franchise is box office gold. Each new film in the series ends up topping the previous one to rave reviews. Fans claim the secret to the film's success is due to the creative vision of the talent who produced them. And the latest edition, Fallout, promises to be no different. Agent located. Save for the James Bond movies, Paramount Pictures' Mission Impossible series is the most bankable espionage franchise at the box office right now. With each follow-up feature, a director who is considered innovative in their field is hired by the financiers to bring a fresh perspective to their mega-budget property. But it is an agency of chaos. You had a terrible choice to make in Berlin. One life over millions. Pleased with the work of the previous installment's director, the movie studio behind the project brought veteran filmmaker Christopher McQuarrie back for Fallout. The story finds Special Agent Ethan Hunt facing the aftermath of a special operation that goes wrong. The Oscar-winning Helmer of the Flick says he is aware of Mission Impossible fans' high expectations when it comes to their favorite franchise. You need to walk away. Please don't make me go through. The pressure I felt this time was to deliver on their expectation that it's a different director every time. I wanted, I, I know that fans of the franchise come to expect that. It's something they enjoy about it. And, and it was very important to me that they felt that. That if you didn't read the credits, you would not know that the same person directed these last two movies. That was really the pressure for me. How many times has Hunt's government betrayed him, disavowed him? The stars who anchor the movie add that they had a blast filming the action-packed sixth follow-up of the high octane series. As a boy, I wanted to join the armed forces. I still want to join the armed forces, but I'm doing this now, and, and I'm happy with this. And I think it's a bit late as well for me to join. I'm getting, getting on now. Uh, but it's... It's all that kind of, that stuff, like being in helicopters, playing with guns, swinging from the rafters, all that kind of thing. I, I love doing it. And this has been a wonderful opportunity and Thomas provided that for me. Ethan, that's not who we are. Fallout managed to garner early positive reactions from critics and has been dubbed possibly the best summer movie of 2018. The best summer movie of 2018 seems like a pretty high expectation for Fallout to live up to. But let's cross to our guest to see what he thinks. Sean O'Connell is the managing director of Cinema Blend and he joins me now from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks so much for being with us uh, today, Sean. Now, the best summer movie of 2018, Mission Impossible Fallout, they've brought back familiar faces and they make uh, allusions to earlier films. Do you think critics are describing it as the most self-aware film because of these reasons? Probably, but also just because by the time we've reached number six in this franchise, um, Tom Cruise specifically, and all of the filmmakers who come on board to help him make these films, they know exactly what the audience wants to deliver. So, and they give them all of that in spades, basically. Um, it's huge stunts big action set pieces, physical stunts that don't involve a lot of CGI. Um, it's very practical. It's very death-defying. It put Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt, um, in danger <laughs> multiple times. But it also produces um, these twisty uh, and unexpected spy plots that, um, that this franchise delivers even better, in my opinion, than the James Bond franchise, mm -hmm. which has grown a little bit musty and has sort of lost its way. Uh, people who really like um, cutting edge, nail biting, thrilling spy films have come to the the Mission franchise looking for uh, rewarding and entertaining films, and this is a franchise that delivers over and over. Sean, tell me about these so called director's effect in each of these sequels. Each chapter up until this point has always been directed by somebody different, and that's been really unique for the franchise because a lot of times, if a franchise is doing really well, they'll hold on to the storyteller. But over the years for Mission Impossible, it started with Brian De Palma. It shifted over to John Woo, 
Um, we've had directors like J.J. Abrams and Brad Bird, Brad Bird, who currently has The Incredibles 2 in theaters. They've all taken a shot at it. The last two movies have been directed by Christopher McQuarrie, who Tom Cruise also worked with on Jack Reacher. And McQuarrie is an Oscar-winning screenwriter. He wrote The Usual Sp uh, Suspects back in the day. So for the first time, Fallout is directed by the same filmmaker um, from one film to the next. And it allows him, in my opinion, to basically learn some from some of the mistakes that he might have made on the previous one to make some improvements. Well, you actually had the chance to sit down and speak with Tom Cruise himself. How does he feel about being the lead uh, character of a very successful movie franchise? I mean, he loves it, and he loves the fact that the audience keeps responding to it. And I think he's a little bit surprised, too, because how many other film franchises, by the, film franchises, by the time they get to number six, um, are still able to surprise and entertain and reward an audience? Usually by this point, they've sort of played themselves out, and they're just repeating themselves. Also with Cruise, and I find this really interesting, he it, previously in his career, he he didn't do sequels. He always looked for new roles, uh, different individuals to play. Now he's doing, you know, six Mission Impossible. So there's something about Ethan Hunt that he really connects with. But at the same time, he's currently filming uh, Top Gun 2. So he's entertaining sequels. Uh, he did a second Jack Reacher film, but I think because um, uh, he enjoyed working with Chris McQuarrie. Uh, he's entertaining the idea of doing a sequel to his sci-fi film, Edge of Tomorrow. So I just don't know. Cruise is 56. Uh, that's an old age for, for an action star. It's not, a, it's not old. I, you know, 56 is the new... 30, basically. But when you're putting yourself through the stunts that Cruz does, um, we're going to hit a point where sooner or later he's not going to be able to pull off these mission films anymore. And I think we're going to look back and say that over the 22 years that Tom worked on these movies from from one till whenever he finishes, it was an incredible run for, for an A-lister who uh, consistently pushed the envelope for action movies. Well, Mission Impossible Fallout is set to hit theaters on July 27th in the United States. Sean, thank you so much for being with us today on Showcase. Always a pleasure. Let's switch things up now as we invite you to get lost in a magical forest just outside Madrid. Here you can find dinosaurs and dragons and other creatures that exist only in fairy tales. What is this place? Well, here's one hint. Any similarity with a very popular motion picture is not a mere coincidence. Remember Edward Scissorhands? Juan Antonio Pizarraya never forgot him. The film amazed me. I went crazy about it and it was the ultimate inspiration for me to create this park. Located an hour's drive from Madrid, the park is called El Bosque Encantado, which means the Enchanted Forest. The Enchanted Forest is a dream I've started 10 years ago. I've always been delighted by vegetal sculptures. I used to do small ones. Imagine that all this was absolutely deserted, and out of nothing, we've planted 500 different kinds of plants from all over the world, and 11 European topiary artists came to help me create these sculptures. There are 320 sculptures spread over 30,000 square meters. Ballerinas, musicians, dinosaurs, dolphins, they all live in harmony along 16 different theme routes. My favorite sculpture is this dragon here because it was very hard to make. This plant normally grows only three meters high and we managed to grow it to almost four meters. It took two and a half years to finish it. To create a sculpture like this, first you have to forge the structure in iron to build the shape. After that, you have to plant and patiently lead the branches to grow around the wires. To maintain the shape, the sculptures have to be trimmed weekly. Open Thursday to Sunday, the enchanted forest is perfect for a family stroll. I think it is a lot of fun. I liked it very much, especially the animals. People told me about this park before, that it was a beautiful place to bring the children, and we thought it would be a good idea to come here this morning. This park has accomplished much more than I ever imagined. 
and it changes every day because the plants are alive. It's like never-ending poetry. Well, that's it on Showcase for now. You can, of course, head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Efnan Han. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.